Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thanks. One voice. Uh, sorry, let me try if this works. Yeah. So, Palm Sunday. I don't know if I should say Happy Palm Sunday. I don't know if it's considered a celebration or not. You can make your own choice. The sermon today is entitled A Life of Hope, Lay It Down, Lift Him Up. Yeah. Uh, the passage that I'm reading is, today is taken from, the whole passage is from Matthew 21. I'm just reading verses 6 to 11 for now. So you can see the PowerPoint. Verse 6, this is also under the title, if you look in your library, of the, triumphal, the Triumphant Entry. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut the branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heavens! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Verse 11, The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, on this Palm Sunday, I pray that as Jerusalem was shaken and stirred and all shook up, I pray that also you will shake up our hearts today, that we will really listen to what you're saying to us. We pray that we'll be sensitive to what the Spirit is doing in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, that we may catch the flow of the Spirit and will walk in your will, Lord. Praying for all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So normally when we meet our friends, we say, how are you? How are you doing? And sometimes they will say, oh, same old, same old, nothing new. Or sometimes they will share with you, a crisis has been happening, things are really bad in my family or at work. Yeah. So on screen now, I put some of the stages to any story and I put it there in case you can, you can recognize it. So you can see one stage, stage one is normal life, also called status quo or same old, same old. Stage two is where things are happening. You can feel things are moving. Something's going to happen, but you're not sure what. And it's called approaching a crisis. Stage three is where the crisis has happened. Uh, it can also be an epiphany. An epiphany is a fancy word for like a turning. Something is changing, like a transformation. If it's not a great epiphany, if not a great season, it is also called the dark night of the soul because what's happening is not very happy. Next, it could be that something has transformed. So after all that darkness, there's a resolution, things have cleared up, and then stage five. Happy ending, you go on and you now come to a new status. So I've shared this with you this morning because I thought that in order to understand Palm Sunday, we might want to see it as a series. It's just a marker. Palm Sunday is significant because as Pastor Enoch has said, we start, this is the start of Holy Week. So I'd like to invite you to think, if, if Palm Sunday, if the Bible stories that we were looking at were to feature on these five stages, where would you place it? So the stages that I've introduced to you is actually from what's called the classic tree, is a tree act series. So if you have been a student of screenwriting or how to write novels or dramas, this is what I'm told. I'm told they teach this. So they tell you how to build the pattern up. Usually you have the protagonist. Protagonist is a fancy word for the hero or the main person of the story. He usually starts from normal life, all is good. And then there's a trigger, something happens. He has to go on a journey. He has to start a quest. Along the way, he will make allies and friends and enemies. And the, uh, there's even timings to each of these stages, by the way. So for a three-hour movie, how, which stage would fit how many minutes? Until the final battle happens, everything blows up, and the hero of the day wins. He rises up, and everything is happy, and all is resolved. So in Palm Sunday, if I asked you, where would you put what's happening? If you were in Jerusalem and a just a regular guy, trying to make a living. And today, wow, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, a lot of hoo-ha. So you can think, would it be status quo? 
is not status quo. And Matthew tells you that because in the passage, the words that Matthew uses, he says that Jerusalem was, the whole city was stirred and they were asking, who is this Jesus? So this is not a real class, I'll tell you my answer. You see on the screen, to me, I think we are, we are approaching the transformation. We are approaching the crux of the story. If this was long, where everybody comes and there's a hero of the day and it all resolves. But this is not a Marvel movie, this is the book. So we are moving towards some kind of climax and we kind of know because we have the benefit of hindsight, we know what that climax is. Yeah, but the people on the streets then, they also were hoping for a climax, but I don't think they got what they hoped for. In their mind, they thought that this Jesus who came was going to save the day, be a military ruler, overthrow the Romans, whom the Jewish had suffered a lot under, and be the hero of the day. So when we say that Jerusalem is all shook up, it's not all positive. We read about those that ran up, cut the branches, put their cloaks on the floor, but there were also those who, if you see later on in Matthew 21 and 22, they were very suspicious, they were wanting to kill him, they had malicious intent. So there were all sorts of different responses. Some welcomed, others doubted him. And today I wanted to use the frame of responding to Jesus coming into Jerusalem for our sermon to see as you, as you read this passage, what would you think your response might be? So this is an analogy for Jesus coming into our lives. How would you respond to him? So there were those who welcomed Jesus. We know because we were told that they went to cut down the branches and they laid it on the floor and they also put their cloaks. I don't think that the cloak was a thing, an item they had a lot of, so I, I think that it was probably a fairly precious item of clothing. But what they did was not brand new. During the Old Testament times, you also read where people are declared king. For example, in 2 Kings 9, when Jehu was appointed king, they also did the same thing. Everybody took their garment and then put it on the steps because the steps was bare. In modern day, you have the red carpet treatment. It's the same idea that this is royalty. He's too good to walk on bare ground. In the weddings, you also have the flower girl throw the petals before the bride comes down. So it is an act of uh, homage or homage if you don't use the silent H. So when we look at this, the, the act of homage is the act of acknowledging that Jesus is king. So would you, would you want to, if you heard Jesus was coming, run out and do that? You want to take off your jacket or your cloak or whatever is precious to you and to lay it down? There were others who also raised up the palm. So these are two very public acts of adoration. And as I reflected on this, I wondered what would be the equivalent of us laying things down for Jesus? What would be something that we're willing to forego or, or to give up? It might be because we have quite a lot of young adults here, our middle age uh, brothers and sisters. It may be that we have certain plans for our life. So you may have a timeline, by a certain time you want to graduate, you want to get your career in shape, then you're going to get married, have two kids, maybe some of you aspire to get a property. So is that something you're willing to lay down for God? If God asked you to pause your life, or if God asked you to change that beautiful plan you have like a movie in your head, is that something you'll be willing to do? I also want to say that our church has many brothers and sisters who are blessed in many ways. For example, you've heard about the appeal for donations to 100, uh, 140th anniversary fund. And sometimes we hear testimonies, oh, last week we asked for the donation and just immediately after that, a brother came up to me and gave a check. And that's great, we should rejoice in that. But I wonder if that also means sometimes you think, eh, eh other people are so well to and they can just come up with a check for $18,000 like that so they don't need me to give. So I just want to remind you, it's not about the gift. Yeah. So in the parable of the widow and the two pennies, she gave all that she had, and that was precious to God. So it's not about what you have to give. So yes, the anniversary fund has a lot of requests, and then you look at your savings, and you think, what is it? But it's your heart of service to God, and that's what you are laying down your plans. The other thing that we saw happening was that uh, pounds were lifted up, all very public. 
and the cutting down of palms wasn't new to them. Why would they randomly go and damage the greenery? If you do that in Singapore, the government will come after you, damaging private, uh, public property. But they were used to that, that practice because the Jewish celebrated something called the Feast of Tabernacles. If you Google Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T, nowadays, modern days, the Jewish still do celebrate it. It is to commemorate the safe passage out of Egypt and also the harvest. So in modern day, when they celebrate it, they build a hut or they make a hut by pretending to lay cloth over it and then they uh, eat and celebrate inside it. So yes, so cutting down of the palms and then waving it around at Jesus. It's quite a public act. I'm not sure if if you can see yourself doing it. So what is it when we talk about lifting up in modern day translation? How are we lifting up Christ in our lives in a public way, even if you look stupid, or even if you wonder it's gonna cost you some disadvantage at work? Does it seem, if you mention that you're Christian, if you want to invite someone to our church mid-autumn festival, does it taint people's uh, perception of you? And if you already have ways that God is calling you to lay something down and to lift him up, that's great. Because I, I have a very strong feeling God is speaking to many of you in your own lives. But if you are looking for ideas, then I would suggest that you can think about your digital life. We now inhabit the digital space a lot, a lot of our time for work, for play. At a training session earlier this week, where we were examining uh, Gen Z and their online persona, someone told me that, guess how many hours a Gen Z person spends online in a day? Then they guess here and there, and they say, oh, uh, research shows, I don't know how re or legit this research is, that a young person may spend about eight hours a day online. Eight hours a day are my office hours. So they, what they spend is my whole working time online. And that's what they grown up with. So for your own online activities, perhaps you can think about how you can lift him up, lift Christ up with what you do online. I know people who for Lent have chosen to fast from online media, and that's fine. If that's not for you, you can think about curating what you look at online. So think about whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is Christ-like. We should look at these things. If you're looking at your phone all the time, you should be looking at Christ-like things. Many of us may be into gaming or inv involved in online communities, and you can get very close to people you've never met before on the other side of the world. Perhaps it's time to just show them your Christ-like love and concern. Mention that you're Christian. Show some kind. You don't have to hit them over the head with it. Just mention things so that people know that you are a follower of Christ, and that if they reach out to you and they experience what you have to give, your kindness, that it's not you. It comes from Christ. Lately, there's been a lot about the metaverse. So if you had to exper experiment with it or learn more for work or for play, then I would invite you to think about how you can carry Christ into that. If we're meant to be the salt and the light of the earth, then we have to bring salt and light even into these spaces. I've heard of dancers learning to dance digitally, maybe. I've heard of um, people doing uh, AV, oh, sorry, P A AR and VR art, yeah, AR and augmented reality and virtual reality art, and then this can be auctioned off. So if you heard about non-fungible tokens, right? And and yeah, okay, whatever. yeah. So so those can now be sold, and they're an asset. So if these are the worlds we are inhabiting, we need to bring bring Christ into these worlds. And I can't tell you what it is because we all have different preferences. For example, Jubilee has just finished our sixth floor media room. So perhaps that's an opportunity to explore more how you can serve. Even for our weekly services, we have, you don't have to be musically inclined to help. You can see at the back, we have people doing sound mixing, PowerPoint, live streaming. It's all about lifting Christ up in a way that is, shows excellence and shows respect. So it's getting things out there. It's been said that when new technology is introduced, usually the vices are the first one to adopt it. Yeah? So who uses things quickest? Because they want to make money. So it, things like uh, gambling, things like porn, they want to reach as many people as possible, or even trafficking rings. That's how they, they get a hit. Time to take technology back. But we can't do that we, if, we're no, if we don't have the skill or the expertise. All right? So, 
lift him up, and then to lay ourselves down. The two things are connected. Some welcome and others doubted. So I just want to make the point that apart from those who ran out with great enthusiasm and those that were plotting at the back, I think there was another group. And I wonder if you may be in that group as well. I wonder if, I think I would, I think I would be the group where I'll be in my home thinking, I oh, yeah, another guy, supposed to be saviour, not as if we haven't had one before. So I might be on the fence or neutral, I might be just kind of wait and see, let's see what happens before I commit to it. I will, I will believe it when I see it. Yeah? But Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So he really does want all of you, and that involves your wholehearted, uh, wholehearted uh, self. There's a meme going around that's called what other people think I do. Usually it's related to your jobs. So I thought it suited this quite well. I think that for the Jewish, it's the extreme left one, they thought this is what Jesus is going to do. That he's going to come and we're going to be rid of our Roman conquerors. And on Palm Sunday, what did Jesus do? He came in on a donkey. And then a few days later, he got himself crucified on the cross. How disappointing is that? So even if you had run out into the streets instead of hanging back at your home, five days later, you would still be disappointed. You'd be, oh, yeah, another one. I thought, I really thought this was the one, but I guess not. And then you go back to your normal lives. So I do ask you to think, the right-hand side one, I wonder, what do you think Jesus will do? I wonder, what do you think Jesus will do for you now? I wonder, as we go through the book of Revelations, how do you think Jesus' coming will be like? And you've not thought about it, then I suggest you do, because at some point, you will have to face this when you come to some obstacles, when people ask you about the God that you serve, and you find that you cannot voice it out. You can't explain something if you yourself are not clear about it. As I reflected, I think a big reason why people hold back is because they're disappointed. They don't want to be disappointed, or they have been disappointed before. Something has happened, and they think, uh, okay, I don't want to be hurt again, so this time let me not fully engage. Let me lower my expectations. Let me try not to be so hopeful. So I fall into that category and I've really been trying to uh, see how God will allow me to be functional and to have an open heart without feeling too hurt to go on. So we're not talking about disappointment with people. Any of us who have been in a significant relationship or have family members will know you will surely be disappointed or angry or sad with them. If you are not, is that even a proper relationship? If you never talk to them, then okay, you've never disappointed with them. But being disappointed with God is quite challenging. Among other things, you might think, should I even be disappointed with God? Does that make me a bad Christian? Then you feel guilty and you try to make yourself uh, feel better. You tell yourself, oh, it's not important, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I must try to think positively. And it may or may not help if you don't even dare to tell other people about it. Because who talks about disappointment with God? By the time people talk about disappointment with God, I think it's usually when it's too far gone. They have lost all hope already. And this is really difficult because we're asked to tell other people about God. But how do you evangelize and tell people, your friend, tell, tell him about God? But what if he asks you, what is your experience? Can you really say, my God is a good God? But you think, eh, later if something happens and you're disappointed by God, will you blame me? Because I introduced you to this God and he's not as great as you say. So even if God hasn't disappointed you before, that's great and I'm happy for your spiritual walk but this is something that you might have to be ready for because that is the walk of a maturing, matured Christian. A writer, Brené Brown, says that disappointment is like a paper cut. Yeah. Sometimes you don't feel it until it's too late and it's very painful, but it doesn't last long. But she also says that if you have no paper cuts, the relationship will deteriorate. You can only hold so much. If you read Philip Yancey's book, which is called disappointment with God, there are a lot of insights there. And he says that some reasons why people are disappointed with God is because uh, God seems unfair. Why I can't have children and my friend has so many, for example. It could be because God is silent. You try to ask him. Other people hear from him a lot, but you don't really hear much. How come like that? Why so unfair? And then finally, is a hidden God. 
You are seeking him, but he's nowhere to be found. So I think Philip Yancey's book is worth reading. He has many, many perspectives, but his conclusion may or may not satisfy you. So what do we do then if we are disappointed, if we know that disappointment looms around the corner? Brené Brown in her book says that we need hope like air. I think that's true. I think if we have no hope, then we have no aims. And another author talks about hope as having three components. This is more cognitive. He says that for hope, we need a goal. What do you care about? What do you want to go for? He says we need a pathway there. How do I get to what I desire? And then you need, uh, he calls it uh, agency, or, or I've forgotten the other word for agency. You need to feel like you can make a difference, that you have something to, you, you, can, make a, you can do something and it will matter. Yeah. So for myself, as I reflect on it, when we lead worship or when we preach, we can only share with you where we've been, I feel. So I'm sharing with you my own experience. I feel that hope is like a capacity. So capacity, what does that mean? For example, we all have lungs, different sizes, some bigger than others. There's a phrase called lung capacity. It's how much your lungs can hold. So uh, swimmers may have exercises where they try to increase the lung capacity, holding their breath, how long you can hold it. How p and for us who are doing vocal training, we have exercises about how slowly you can let your breath out, can you control your breath. So all this is about the capacity. It's the same lungs, but with some practice, with some experience, I think lungs or air and hope can really improve. So how do we grow our faith, our hope? One way is through trials and ad advers adversarial uh, and things that happen to us that are bad and trusting in God. But we don't have to get to that part before we start the, sorry, start the training so-called. Yeah. So these are some suggestions of normal day life to just keep our hope capacity in good shape. These are things we do already, coming regular, regular reminders, coming to service. Actually, every week we do the same thing. We call to worship, we confess, assurance of pardon. And even for those of us who preach, sometimes we feel like we're nagging because we're actually saying the same things over again. But we need it. We have short memories and we forget. And we need it because we need to build our hope. We need to go to cell group. We need to share our testimonies with our brothers and sisters. We need to listen and we need to share out. Then we will, we will not forget and we will remember, ah, this is what God has done for me. Therefore, I can hope in it. So the other suggestion I have is that hope and disappointment or sadness, they're all emotions. You feel them in the heart. Therefore, to build capacity for hope, to me, you really have to build your spirit and your soul, the heart. So you can read books, but that only speaks to the mind. And as we are body, we are, we are, we are uh, heart, okay, and we are uh, head, heart, and hands, yeah, that we need to really address all three. So I've suggested that songs, that dancing, that drawing, that poems, all the things that are not so cognitive, will really help us to build our spirit up so that we can have this capacity for hope. Because I can tell you, just knowing about Jesus or God is probably not enough to make you want to run out to the streets to meet him, wanting to lay your cloak down, wanting to wave your palm branches. It's, it's not enough. So coming back to the passage today, if you read earlier in Matthew 21, you will see this verse there. The coming of Zion's king, rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion, shout, daughters of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And what is this about? This is actually a passage from Zechariah 9. So readers of Matthew would have recognized it. And Zechariah 9 was addressed to the post-exilic Jewish. So these were people who had after they were captured and left Jerusalem, they had come back, but they were still suffering. After coming back to Jerusalem, they were still suffering because one after another foreign party still was ruling them, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. So when they hoped in God, it was hope for liberation. And the reason why Jesus was riding on a donkey is not because it was a show of humility, because part of the Israelites' hope was that they don't want any more war. They had seen a lot of war. They were tired of war. 
So instead of the king coming in on a war horse, that's the alternative. Yeah. The king coming in, Jesus coming in on a donkey, is God's promise there that he, they will return as prisoners of hope and he, they, God will take away all the instruments of war. So no more swords, no more fighting because they're really sick of it. So the story continues for us as well as for the Israelites. For today, we know that this is very simplistic. It's just one story. But for us, the story continues. Multiple stories because actually our climax is when Jesus comes again. And as we journey through Revelations, so many, many stories, I didn't even attempt to plot it. It's a bit like the multiverse thing, too many for us. And we don't know what's happening, but God does. And as we move towards the final climax, sometimes it feels that we can't really see. But you know what, it's okay, because you hope in something, an outcome, but you also hope in someone. And since we can't really see the outcome, well, Revelations tells you, but yeah, that may not be good enough for you, then you must hope in someone. And our, in journeying in hope, our promise is that Jesus Christ is our living hope. Jesus Christ is our living hope today, tomorrow, and forever. Palm Sunday is the start of a roller coaster week. So there's Ash Wednesday, there's uh, Monday, Thursday. Then if you read the Bible, there's Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus crying there. Just to say that if you feel disappointed, I don't think it's just you. You think Jesus didn't feel disappointed. His disciples turned out like that. Do you think God doesn't feel disappointed? All those generations of Israelite disappointing him over and over again. But you can be disappointed in someone, but still not let go. Yeah, some of you have children. Yeah, they're not always making you proud of them, but you still love them. So that is God for us today. And Christ is the emblem of that long-lasting love and covenant. So as I conclude this sermon, I'm going to invite us to build hope together through a song. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. In this roller coaster of emotions, you're so hopeful, but you're disappointed, and then you feel guilty. We just need to keep looking at, at, at Christ. The Hosanna, the meaning of Hosanna actually has a double meaning. One meaning is praise to the God who saves us, so it's thanksgiving. But actually the other meaning is, is a plea, is begging him, please come and save us. Please come and save us. We're begging him. So today, let's confess that he is God. With this song, is he worthy? And I do invite you to stand. It's a response tree song. The band will lead and then uh, please respond accordingly. As we say, he is worthy, Revelations 5, who is worthy for this new order where even God, Jesus, and nobody will be disappointed anymore.